But meanwhile, we have Professor Martin Bell to talk about some of his work and his studies on the Severn Estuary. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to focus on the uh, 30 years or so of work that we've done on the intertidal zone of the Severn Estuary, but I will occasionally um, allow myself to stray to other areas of intertidal archaeology around the coast of the British Isles in order to, to develop some specific points. And I think the first thing to emphasise is the extent to which research in the Severn Estuary has depended on discoveries made by somebody who wasn't a professional um, uh, academic uh, at, at all. He was uh, a skilled steelwork technician at uh, Llanwern Steelworks, Derek Upton, who was born and bred in the Severn Estuary and he knew the intertidal zone absolutely intimately. He was a local nature conservation warden in his spare time and he realised that the things that he was observing as he walked along the shore were important and interesting and appeared to be early. And for decades he had great difficulty persuading any academic archaeologists that these were in any way significant. And the reason for that was that their model of archaeology was very much a dryland archaeology. The things that he was observing didn't make any sense in the context of dryland archaeology because they were reflecting specific activities and types of sites associated with wetlands that weren't present in a dryland situation at all. Eventually, he succeeded in persuading um, some of a sort of younger generation of archaeologists about the importance of what he'd found. Um, my colleague, Professor John Allen, established the sedimentary sequence in the Severn Estuary, which showed that some of Derek's finds were indeed prehistoric, and people started getting radiocarbon dates, which um, proved that point. He ended up getting a, an honorary degree from um, the University of Wales, and you can see the, the ceremony at the bottom there. Sadly, um, like the other great pioneer of the, the North West that we've already heard about, Gordon Roberts, um, Derek is no longer with us to see the way in which the m many discoveries that have, he made um, have um, still stimulating re important research projects. One of the current obsessions that I have really is about the potential of intertidal zones, not just for post-glacial archaeology, but for the study of the Paleolithic archaeology of the Ice Ages. And uh, this is actually one of the first sites I worked on in the intertidal zone, Breen Down near Western Supermare in Somerset, where in the background there we're digging a Bronze Age settlement that was weathering out of the cliff face um, and uh, produced a fantastic sequence of seven metres of stratified Bronze Age activity representing several different phases. But the point I particularly want to make today is that that seven metres of um, prehistoric um, post-glacial activity actually overlies a 30 metre sequence of ice age deposits, blown sands and eroded head from that limestone cliff. Now there isn't actually archaeological material on this site but what we're increasingly finding um, is that are exposures of ice age sediments in the intertidal zone which I think deserve very much more attention as potential sources um, of environmental and archaeological evidence. So that's going to be one of the sort of sub-themes of my talk today. And indeed that's very evident in the area where I'm working in, in the Severn Estuary. This is a photograph of the Severn Estuary foreshore um, and it shows a sort of oval area here and that is a former island which has been almost entirely eroded away and in fact the reason it shows up on that air photograph is that it's surrounded by a fossil beach which is this black area and that's cemented by um, the d deposition of uh, carbonaceous material 
So it's a sandy beach which has been turned into a sand rock essentially so that, that is actually harder than the bedrock of the island itself which is in the, in the middle here this grey deposit that's mercy and mudstone which is softer than cemented beach so we've got this lovely last interglacial 120,000 year old beach surrounding the former island and picking it out really neatly and the sediments that produce post-glacial deposits in this area the peats and silts uh, surround that island and the, the island was gradually submerged by the Holocene sea level rise um, and successive sites around the edge of the island were buried um, by peats and silts, producing a 15 metre sequence of sediments um, covering the sort of middle Mesolithic to the present day. So it's a, a very rich area um, archaeologically. That shows the extent of that island, the present day coastline is marked by the, the sea wall here and the, most of the, the little bit of the island that survives is marked in, in filled in yellow and that's the position of the former beach marking the edge of the island in the Mesolithic. The red line is a transect um, which uh, represents the section across the foreshore um, illustrating the various layers of peat and silt um, and successive erosion and deposition episodes which establish the sedimentary sequence in which the archaeology occurs. That enables me to make another key point really, the importance in these areas of trying to put sites into a geoarchaeological or sedimentary sequence of sorting out the main sedimentary units and that can often mean working with physical geographers um, and geologists who are uh, interested in um, those sort of coastal processes over a long time perspective. We've already seen the benefits and importance of monitoring coastal change um, over time. Um, now what really highlights the importance of intertidal archaeology for the study of um, Paleolithic or Ice Age archaeology are uh, discoveries at Haysborough in Norfolk, um, which I dare say you've heard about, where they found human footprints which are about 800,000 years old. This is the earliest evidence for human activity anywhere in Northwest Europe and it's fundamentally changed our ideas about the archaeology of those periods. We thought that people at the time were restricted to more southerly areas of Europe and they couldn't really tolerate the, um, the, 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 the colder conditions that, it, that existed at, during this particular um, interglacial stage in, in Northern Europe, but they were there. And we've got a really good picture from the work that Nick Ashton and his team from the Natural History Museum have, have done on this site. And they found uh, flint flakes, as you can see there, mammoth teeth, and the photo, photogrammetric representation at the bottom right shows some of the human footprints. And we've got similar Ice Age deposits in the area where I'm working at Gold Cliff in the Seven Estuary. The, the, the shell that you can see at the top uh, the top left there is um, um, uh, from the last interglacial beach, about 120,000 years, and there are beds with bison bones as well. One of them is represented there. That's in head that eroded off the edge of this island. I'm emphasising these, these Ice Age deposits because it seems to me that notwithstanding the discoveries at Haysborough and one or two other places, this potential for Paleolithic archaeology and Ice Age environmental evidence in the intertidal zone hasn't really been sufficiently explored in, in many parts of the country actually and I think that's something that we could particularly focus on. Um, this illustrates some of our recent discoveries of that period from Gold Cliff itself where we've got uh, uh, raised beach deposits exposed here at the bottom overlain by Ice Age head from the last uh, glaciation period. Well, this is outside the margins of the glaciation, but it's a periglacial zone. And then this black layer at the top is the Holocene, the post-glacial Mesolithic old land surface um, with a peaty top. 
peaty top as a result of wetland conditions that developed as a result of sea level rise. Um, this particular surface is at minus four metres OD, so it's only exposed at, at very low tides. And just lately, we've started to find some rather exciting flint implements, not at the moment in situ, but near here, apparently weathered out of one of these layers. Um, so there's a leaf point um, in the middle there, and a really nice scraper, um, and that shows the um, invasive retouch on the ventral surface of the, this leaf point, which uh, um, highlights its early Upper Paleolithic date. And here we are um, monitoring the erosion of, a, of another, later, Mesolithic site, um, where the, uh, the point I want to make here is the value of long-term monitoring. I first surveyed this particular area um, 19 years ago, um, and we were interested in it because it's got a lovely submerged forest. You can see one of the tree stumps there and then the peat surface in the background. But this area was completely blank of archaeology. We didn't find anything um, there apart from one or two bits of charcoal. Then nine, after 19 years of keeping an eye on it, we suddenly <laughs> discovered that there were flints, hazelnuts and animal bones um, weathering out of this particular exposure. Um, and what we did was put in four pins to, to mark the area of interest and then every time we go there we record um, the positions of uh, each individual find so that we can build up a picture. So this isn't involving any excavation. You couldn't really do an excavation there. It's only exposed for about an hour um, at, at, at low spring tides. But what you can do is use that time to plot what's exposed. So the sea does the excavation, we do the recording. And here's another site where we've done that. This was another spot that I'd been um, visiting for um, about 20 years. No finds at all. Suddenly a deer bone appears. And um, as a result of, uh, of work over eight years, this is the plot that we've made of the distribution of the finds. Again, just by putting in four pins that we can uh, measure things from. Um, over, over that period, and there's uh, various finds shown from there. Hazelnut, uh, deer bone, boar's tusk, and here we are busily recording things before um, the sea comes in and, uh, and covers it all up again. Um, now, some people, some archaeologists, I suspect, would tell you that this is a complete waste of time. It's only a tiny little scatter. It's not terribly important. Um, I take a very different view, actually, because I think what we're discovering from many of these areas where we're looking at Mesolithic uh, sites is that they tend to comprise these small, dis discrete clusters. They're not great big spreads of masses of material like you might find associated with middens on the coast of Denmark, but they're very particular little cl small-scale clusters. And I think that says something absolutely fundamental about the period, actually. <coughs> it suggests that people are moving around. They're not staying for very long, because if they did, if they stayed in one place for a long time, instead of getting these little clusters, you'd get a great big sort of spread of material without sharp edges. So I argue that the, the character of the distribution here is telling us that these are mobile people um, that are visited for short periods of time. Um, now we can also <coughs> develop that hypothesis, of course, using the environmental evidence and the, and the other clues we've got. But it does highlight the point, the value, I would say, of recording even little clusters like this, because you can build up a meaningful picture um, over the years. And um, just uh, about four weeks ago, at the last um, decent spring tide we had, I was there with one of my master's students who's doing his dissertation on um, the study of isotopes from wild animals uh, in these uh, beds, and we found another site. This, was, this is on the surface of that peat. There's the peat surface, and here he's pointing at a deer bone um, weathering out of the peat. Now, that deer bone had cut marks on it, and there is no other archaeological <coughs> material nearer than about 
<laughs> 50 metres of that find. So I'm guessing, actually, as we keep an eye on that spot, now we can recognise its possible significance. We're probably going to find that there's another one of these little clusters uh, somewhere near there. It's uh, really handy, actually, because it's only seven metres away from some of the <coughs> human footprints that we've recorded recently. Um, now, one thing that, that we've done quite a lot of in the, in the, in the seven is, is working with various um, media um, organisations in order to um, make the archaeology more widely known. Because, I mean, I churn out great big monographs, which I'll show you some pictures of in the end, in the faint hope that somebody might find <laughs> one of them interesting. But the reality, of course, is that nobody reads this stuff. And um, uh, even my own students, you know. <laughs> um, and in, in order to make the archaeology more widely known, one really has to, has to work with things like television programmes. This was the history of ancient Britain where Neil Oliver came and um, talked about the, the human footprints. And we, um, we've got a big problem with mud in the Seven Estuary. It's a terribly muddy estuary, and you have to wash away the mud, with you, in this case using pressure hoses, in order to see the footprints. Gosh, what have I done here? <laughs> Destroying the equipment. There we are. Um, and we also had the National Geographic with us um, uh, uh, for, for, for a week at one stage. They sent two photographers over from New York to record what we were doing. And, and for the benefit, from my point of view, of that was, A, some lovely photographs, but more importantly, these lovely um, artistic reconstructions, which were way beyond the, the sort of budget that we could have afforded from our own um, modest resources. This shows the, one of the sites um, as it's drowned by sea level rise. And, of course, as, um, as uh, we've heard from, from, from Alison, there are new forms of really exciting archaeological evidence in these intertidal contexts, which haven't really been um, recognised until quite recently. I suppose Gordon Roberts' work at Formby was one of the things that really um, brought these to public attention. Um, and some of them are wonderfully preserved and incredibly informative. Um, example there of a, of a human f footprint on the left, um, a, a bird at the top right, and crane footprints at the, at the bottom right. So we can write an account of what people were doing and what animals were present in this particular environment on the basis of the footprint evidence, and then we can compare that with the evidence from the flints or the pollen or the insects, um, so that we're building up a much richer picture than could possibly be achieved just by looking at scatters of flints on dry land, which is how we've tended to write the archaeology of the Mesolithic period. Um, and this, the, the way we've gone about this has sort of evolved through time, and I thought that might be helpful to you to say something about the different methods we've used at different stages. Uh, to start off with, we use conventional planning of the, of the footprints, drawing them with a sort of drawing frame. Um, but of course, there isn't enough time to do that properly. Um, we've also tried tracing them on sheets of plastic, and you can see that going on here. Um, that's quite good in that you can make a reasonably rap rap rapid record, but it is nothing like accurate enough, actually, to produce a faithful um, record of the prints themselves. So it's good for recognising patterns, not very good for more sophisticated identification. And lately, of course, we've got the uh, availability of differential GPS, which enables us to survey their position to within about a centimetre. And that's incredibly valuable, particularly in terms of the, the height data and particularly in terms of monitoring the erosion of these deposits and how rapidly that's occurring um, over time. And then combining that with 3D photogrammetry um, and laser scanning in order to make a rapid record of the footprints themselves. And you can see those, those processes going on here. The stalk of the differential GPS recording the positions of these targets and then the scanning 
um, which actually we haven't found works terribly well, to be honest. The 3D photogrammetry um, is the answer, I think, to, uh, to this, and that involves laying down these targets and then taking about 50 uh, photographs in a cloud around them, then stitching those photographs together in order to create a 3D image of the footprint surface. And that can be done within about half an hour, which is the sort of time you've got available after you, you've cleaned them up and um, done all the sort of basic numbering and things like that. We have about an hour and a half at a good tide before the sea comes in. Uh, that shows uh, Kirsten Barr, who's just finished her PhD on these footprints at Reading University and the technique that she's developed for rapid recording. Um, she's demonstrating that here with recording of crane footprints at the top and then two uh, not terribly great human footprints. I mean, that one at least is, is recognisable. And this is the 3D um, photogrammetric image that she's created from that cloud of photographs. The blue um, rectangles there show the, six, the positions of the camera um, in building up that 3D model. And there's a guide to all this which you can find on the Citizen website uh, together with the, I think, targets that you can download in order to, to, create, these, uh, to create these models. <coughs> she did that as a bit of sort of outreach from her PhD project. Now, what has really transformed our capacity for survey in the intertidal zone lately is working with one of my physical geography colleagues, Dr. Kevin White, who is a specialist in drone survey. And he came out with us a year ago and in an hour flew this drone survey of the area where most of the footprints occurred, taking several hundred photographs and again stitching these together in order to create this plan of the area. Previously, we got loads of data for bit, little bits of this, but the little bits are all uncovered at different times as a result of erosion and so on, and it was incredibly difficult to stitch them together into some sort of overall plan. But using the drone survey as a base and the differential GPS positions that we um, recorded for the earlier finds, um, we were able to, we've been able to do that. Um, bottom right coloured image is the um, elevation model that he's created for, for, for this area. I mean, that shows the peak shelf, for instance. There are these bars which are actually modern gravel bars which are moving around. Um, it shows the positions of the laminated silts in which the footprints occur, which are the sort of lighter blue bands that, that go in this direction and the footprints occur on those. So that was great. That was the answer to all our prayers about creating an overall plan and putting the whole thing into a context together. But it had a surprising <coughs> additional benefit because in order to do that drone survey, we had to put out great rectangular targets, about 12 of them on the foreshore, that enable you to stitch the multiple photographs together. And to put these targets out, we had to go to a bit of the foreshore we never looked at because I was quite confident there was nothing there. We didn't need to bother about that at all. Well, I was totally wrong, as always, because one of my helpers in putting the target down noticed bits of wood sticking out of this completely uninteresting area. <laughs> and he discovered the um, first Mesolithic foot tra uh, fish trap that's been found in, in the British Isles. There were bits of wood sticking up and little wattles here um, and these beautifully worked wooden stakes um, which we've now dated to the, to the Mesolithic period. So that's a really exciting find. I, I've known for 20 years that, this fish, that, that fish traps existed there because we excavate the settlement sites and there are loads of tiny little uh, eel bones in particular and where you get lots of tiny um, fish and uh, things like eels then you, the likelihood is that they're using these basketry traps um, but you know I spent 20 years searching the foreshore for these only for them to turn up just about a year ago as a result of this, um, this drone survey. Clearly we've been looking in the wrong place all, along, all throughout that time and here's a plan which we've produced 
uh, using a combination of a conventional uh, planning and the, the results of the drone survey showing the, the sort of V-shaped um, baskets that um, wattle work fences that they were using to, to catch their fish. And that particular example is 6,000 BP. That's un uncalibrated. And there's the plan that we've been able to produce showing um, about 12 years' work, I suppose, of footprint recording um, on the base plan of the sediments, which was produced by the drone survey. And the really exciting thing about that is that you've got lines of trails in various places and you can begin to see patterns emerging. They're actually converging on a spot on the edge of this former bedrock island where I'm fairly sure there was a settlement. The settlement has actually gone now, it's been completely eroded away, but we can predict its location from these footpaths that were, were radiating to, towards it. Others of the footprint trails actually lead to settlements that we've excavated. We've excavated five Mesolithic settlements on the foreshore here. So we've got artifact assemblages, bones, botanical evidence, um, which tell us that what people were doing here. Here's a particularly nice example. I've spent uh, the last four years writing a book about prehistoric routeways and trackways, and here we've got the nearest thing to a Mesolithic footpath, really. Um, again, built up over several years. This is five years recording as these gravel bars move around, but you can see the result is that the footpaths are all in the same direction, or nearly all in the same direction, and they're actually going from a spot on the edge of that island to a paleo channel, um, uh, and the, um, the, the fish trap was within that paleo channel. So these are people walking back and forth, checking the fish traps um, to remove their catch. A, they're very poor footprints, actually, but you can see that they recording them systematically does enable us to eventually come up with some sort of idea of what was, what was going on. Another of the points I want to make is that the importance of trying to relate this sort of coastal archaeology to what was happening on dry land. Um, one criticism I think that's been made of what we've done in the seven, uh, at an early stage anyway, was that there was so much was eroding away that we were completely preoccupied with trying to record things as they eroded away and we weren't focused enough on how it related to the bigger picture of dryland activities. And I think that is uh, an important thing to do. So I've got a couple of examples. One of them is, is Mesolithic. This shows um, how we think people may have been <coughs> moving around seasonally between this former island and um, sites in river valleys, um, uplands and other coastal situations seasonally. It's only a hypothetical model, but we can test that hypothetical model by looking at the evidence from the individual types of sites and the evidence for seasonality associated with them from plant and animal remains uh, particularly. Um, I thought I'd put on a, a picture of something which is a bit nearer you, um, where we've also done a little bit of work at Rill in North Wales, where you've got a submerged forest sub uh, exposed on the foreshore, a long history of archaeological finds, mostly in, in the sort of 1920s, um, Mesolithic mattock there, which is dated 5500 BC, and a crake fluid axe. Um, but in, uh, I, I, for um, about 10 years I visited um, this area for a week each year and we started finding footprints here on the, on the sort of opposite side of the D estuary to the, to the Formby finds. There's a, there's a human footprint there and some, um, some deer and aurochs footprints. So these, uh, I suppose one of the main points from both my talk and Alison's really is that this footprint evidence is likely to be far more widespread than we appreciate. And actually, I, I would say that every area of intertidal um, sediments that I've visited, if there are 
fine-grained Holocene deposits. I've found some evidence for footprints, actually, in the last, uh, in the last 10 years. They're, they're all over the place, but they're not widely recognised. Um, and this shows what I did at Rill over about 10 years. Um, this is just with a little handheld GPS device, the sort of thing that I expect many of you have got. In fact, many of you can probably do this on your phones now. Um, you, locating yourself within about three metres and built up this map of the things that are exposed on the foreshore and how that relates to the earlier discoveries that have been made there since the 1920s. So it's a very crude map but it does at least, it forms a basis of for future recording. And in the Seven Estuary, there are many other types of site that we've uh, investigated. I've focused on the, the Mesolithic today and a little bit on the Paleolithic because I'm sort of obsessed with that at the moment. But um, the most extensive sites we've excavated are, are later. This is a Middle Bronze Age settlement, one of the buildings of a Middle Bronze Age settlement on the top of a peat shelf um, at Redwick. That dates to about 1200 BC. And it's on a level heat surface here um, just in front of the, the sea wall and there's a cliff at the front where that peat bog has been eroded. These people were living at the edge of salt marsh um, and grazing their animals on the salt marsh I think and there's a reconstruction of what that site might have looked like in the Middle Bronze Age. Seasonal cattle herders and my theory is that this process of seasonal cattle herding was very much more extensive during the um, Bronze Age and Iron Age than we've um, generally appreciated. As a child there driving the cow, you've got footprints of a, of a seven-year-old child in the, in the channel there, and the channel themselves are covered in footprints of cattle and sheep. And here, 17 years recording at that site between Redwick and Cold Harbour, many different discoveries, fish traps, trackways, submerged forest trees, all these marks here are the trees of a um, middle Mesolithic submerged forest, um, way below the, the um, surface of the peat bog where the Middle Bronze Age activity is, which is all these sites. So a great wealth of archaeology in that area. Um, and I put on this other slide, because this is an area which is also relevant to the current work of, of Citizen, I believe. One of my master's students, Peter Slaughter, has been recording for about the last 10 years intertidal archaeology at Swalecliff, where he's found um, bones of Pleistocene animals, possibly hippo, mammoth, um, and a lot of evidence for activity in paleo channels. Um, where there is both natural wood and worked wood. Here's a wooden stake, which I expect is probably part of a washed out Bronze Age fish trap, actually. And loads of heat fractured flint and quite a lot of pottery as well. This picture shows masses of heat fractured flint. So there's a burnt mound of Bronze Age date somewhere near the edge of that channel, I would imagine. Um, the value of long-term recording, I hope, is sort of obvious from everything I've said, but here we are again at Goldcliff with a, with a rather nice Iron Age trackway, one of 17 exposed here on the foreshore, and that's what it looked like when we did our original excavation in 1992, and then I went back in 2014, and you've got a far greater um, extent um, exposed by erosion, but actually only visible on that particular day after a storm. Since then it's been covered up with mud um, and invisible. So it's partly a matter of being in the right place at the right time, and of course that's why local and community effort in these things is absolutely central. You know, normally when there's a big storm, I'm giving a lecture or attending some completely pointless meeting or something, um, and, you know, can't go there. But local people, of course, are on the spot. They see the massive storm taking place, and that's when the big discoveries are going to be made. I've only been there at Goldcliffe working since 1991. I've only been there once on the occasion of a big storm. 
and on that occasion we found four Iron Age houses and about ten trackways and a, and a human skull. Um, you know, most of the discoveries actually resulted from that storm. Um, here are the um, some of the finds from Goldcliff. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <coughs> Um, a Iron Age house. That was one that came out of that storm, actually. Wooden building, dated, most, one of the most precisely dated prehistoric buildings in Britain, April or May 273 <laughs> BC, um, dated by dendrochronology. And then there are trackways here, again Iron Age. And these, this map shows the uh, location of the buildings, which are the dots, and the red lines are the lines of trackways and this is sort of re-emphasizing that point that I was making um, by recording things systematically over time you can begin to get an idea of the patterns of movement and the patterns of connectivity some of these trackways lead to buildings um, as you can see here others lead somewhere well, we haven't got anything at the moment because that's buried, but that actually tells us where we need to keep an eye on as erosion continues, because I would be fairly sure that there's either going to be a building or an activity area at these points where wooden trackways converge. This is a map showing the um, Bronze Age coastal and wetland sites um, in, uh, um, in the British Isles, as it, as it was when I wrote my uh, monograph on, on the Bronze Age. And it's really designed to highlight that this evidence for coastal and salt marsh exploitation, trackways, footprints and other finds is incredibly widespread actually, and it is steadily transforming our knowledge of um, Bronze Age archaeology, um, complementing the much fuller picture that we've got from years and generations of work in dryland contexts. And from that we can build up a sort of model of the relationship between the dryland archaeology, the settlements and fields on dry land, and the more seasonal and specialist activities that were going on in wetland, which include seasonal grazing, fishing, salt extraction, and so on. So that really highlights the importance of trying to put these wetland finds into this broader archaeological picture. Um, a pattern which I, I sort of describe as lesser transhuman, seasonal movement to wetlands and uplands um, during uh, the Bronze Age. And of course the rapid coastal zone assessments have uh, contributed to this picture. This, this is one that was done by, led by local authorities in the Severn Estuary which produced massive amounts of evidence for mes uh, medieval uh, fish traps. Um, as you can see some examples here. So many different periods um, and uh, you know, the approach they adopted for that rapid coastal zone assessment complemented what we'd done, which was very much my work almost entirely focused on prehistory really. And there have been some exciting boat discoveries which just shows how you know how important this intertidal um, work can, can be in the long term. Bits of Bronze Age boat from um, our site at Goldcliff. These are boat planks from a from a sewn plank boat, um, Roman boat uh, called at uh, Barland's Farm. Um, and Magor Hill, medieval boat, and then the Newport ship, which has attracted a huge interest um, from uh, uh, not, not so much from intertidal survey, but from building work that was going on in, uh, adjacent to the, to, to the river. Now these sorts of things of course terrify planners and um, people that pay for archaeology, but they are nonetheless incredibly important, and there must be so many boat finds of different dates out there um, to be discovered. Now one of the things that I think personally is really important, I just want to emphasise in finishing, is the importance of getting this information into the public domain in different ways. I mean I've mentioned the television programmes and things like that but of course those are um, important but ephemeral. And in the 7th Estuary we've uh, produced 
um, these annual reports, Archaeology in the Seven Estuary, of which we've done 22 volumes so far, and this is just about to become a free, open access and online resource which anybody can use and I hope will be um, much more broadly and widely read than the, than the printed version. But, so there's an awful lot of information there that, that is available and might be helpful to you in seeing what's happened in other areas. And then we've also done these nine monographs uh, produced in the Council for British Archaeology Research Report series, um, which uh, amount to about two million words on the coastal archaeology of the, the Seven Estuary. Now, I appreciate that this is not all sort of perfect in that not everybody can get hold of these things and, and so on, but I do think that it's really important in moving forward that we make sure that all the important discoveries that are being made produce some sort of permanent accessible record, a record which um, is in a sort of final considered form and attempts to put the sites into their broader context, including the connections to the dry land and the environmental evidence and so on. So you need a sort of multi-stage strategy, don't you? But the end point um, needs to be a, a final considered reflection on what was discovered. And there are also some popular leaflets and things like that which uh, uh, mainly owe to the initiative of Richard Brunning, who's the Somerset Levels um, archaeologist and has played a key part in Seven Estuary research. So I've tried to cram in uh, you know, quite a few different points that I hope will be um, of, of some interest or use. Um, first of all, of course, the co contribution of people who aren't sort of academic archaeologists highlighted by Derek Upton. We've also heard about Gordon Roberts. The importance of the geoarchaeological or sedimentary context, which I've illustrated by our work at Goldcliffe. The potential for really exciting, game-changing, Paleolithic and Pleistocene archaeological discoveries, um, as illustrated by Haysborough. The value of long-term cumulative recording, which has come out of almost everything I've said, but um, it was illustrated by that plan of Redwick and the work at, at Rill, much smaller scale work at Rill. Footprints as an important new source of evidence for archaeology. I hope that's obvious from the, both the talks that we've given today. The should say evolving recording methods <laughs> from tracing, handheld GPS, differential GPS, photogrammetry and then drone survey and of course each of those stages is useful and um, you know one has to work with what one's got at the time when you make a, a, an interesting discovery. The need to make connections between wetland and dryland patterns of exploitation, and I've illustrated that with the models that we've developed for Mesolithic and later Bronze Age uh, activity in the coastal zone. The potential for major future discoveries, things like boats and ships, and then finally the importance of publication and dissemination, which must of course include um, in fact, I think you could say, in a sense, the most important thing is the entry of the discoveries into the historic environment record so that people responsible for planning decisions can factor those into the, the decisions that they make. But that also needs to be backed up by these more reflective analysis of the <coughs> discoveries themselves beyond the basic record. So there we are. That's, uh, that's the end of my talk.